as another day draws to a close in the capital. The nighttime world of London's wholesale food markets is beginning to stir. Between them, these London institutions have been supplying the city with fish, meat and fruit and vegetables for centuries and are a rich theme in London's history. But how relevant are they today? And what will their role be in the London of tomorrow? New Spitalfields, in the east end of London, is Britain's largest wholesale food market. At midnight, 150 traders gather to buy and sell over 4,000 tonnes of fresh produce every night. It literally has been growing up until 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon and it will be served up for breakfast in a West End restaurant. That's, and that's how efficient we can be in this way. It's miles more efficient than... What's that word we don't use in the trade? Oh, that's right, supermarkets. We don't use that word at all. <laughs> You'll find every type of fruit and veg under the sun here. Produce unheard of in Britain a generation ago. That's a pepino melon, you know, grows on a tree, actual fact. And people from the far corners of the world looking for a better life. Listen, you're not illegal, are you? No, I'm not oh, illegal. Good. I'm, I'm the British. Oh, yeah. I'm British. Show your passport. Passport, show me, When Spitalfields left its original site in the heart of London 21 years ago, the old market changed forever. New traders moved in to serve the growing immigrant communities of the East End, people for whom food had a deeper meaning. In this changing world, the traditional greengrocer is struggling to survive. Dying industry. Greengrocers, people used to sell fruit and veg no more. Finished. <laughs> Morning, Ali. How are you? Very well, thank you. Have you been up all night counting your money? No, no, no not at all. all. No, I'm very in trouble. <laughs> Three quarters of a billion pounds changes hands here every year. But only those that are willing to adapt will survive. Peter Thomas has worked in Spitalfields since he was 15 years old. As a boy, He'd sit alongside his dad in their lorry and soak up the tricks of the trade. Nearly 40 years later, he's one of the market's most powerful buyers. The world is hands on. Hands on. Having, having your hands right, right round your business, like an octopus. That's the, secret, that's the secret of success. Having your hands wrapped right round the business. Particularly now, when things are so hard. You can't afford to leave a stone unturned. Bye, day. Every night, Peter will spend more than £25,000 here, buying for everyone from Her Majesty's prisons to schools and hospitals, as well as many of London's finest Ooh. restaurants. In the run-up to Christmas, Peter is under pressure to hunt down an important order. Do you sell long aubergine, Japanese aubergine? No. No? All right, love you, boy. Thank you. Long aubergine? They call them Japanese aubergines. And for a special, for a special dish, I might have to send normal ones out, which I don't really like doing. Morning. You got long aubergine? No. You got long aubergine? No, nothing. I hate not getting stuff. It drives me mad. The customer wants it, and I must fulfil that order. Otherwise, it drives me mad if I don't. Did your dad do this, Peter? No, nah, all he ever done was sold potatoes, my dad. Someone used to ask him for a box of cabbage, well, you think it's the end of the world. That's what we've done, we only sold potatoes to fish and chip shops and pie shops. I mean, they come to a stage with me dad that I said, Dad, we can't carry on doing this. We've got to, uh, we've got to change, the, uh, change the situation. The business is, the catering business is, is far bigger and greater than what we're doing. You know, there's a big world out there. Peter and his dad started with one wheelbarrow to deliver their potatoes. He now has a fleet of 38 lorries. I went to a school called Fairmead, and it was quite, quite a notorious, tough school, you know. And um, 
I'm 40, I'll cut and keep uh, a travel. I was quite a good footballer and done all good sportsmen and all that. Academically, I weren't that successful. Or I, I, didn't, I couldn't concentrate. So con consequently, they, they, um, they told me they didn't require my services slightly earlier than um, perhaps normal kids there. And they did say to me, my headmaster didn't like me one bit. He said, son, you'll be in the gutter all your life. And it's probably the best thing that everyone's ever said to me. He went on to grow his family business into a multi-million pound fruit and veg empire. Well, you know what I mean by Japanese, don't you? All right, listen, I don't care, I don't want no excuses. You've got to get it, it's for a special customer and it's going to drive me fucking mad if you don't get it. I don't care if you have got to drive half hour, go and drive half hour and go and get it. Yes, now. It's like fighting a war, really. All good leaders are up there in the front with their soldiers, you know what I mean? Got to be up there to lead the thing. All the Nelsons, all the Wellingtons. That was all there, mate. Peter is moving with the times. But there are others in the market who are finding it harder to adapt to London's changing tastes. Bill's family business has been selling traditional British vegetables like turnips and celery since the 1860s. But these days, business isn't booming. We used to sell a lot of celery, did you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Celery, spring onions, radishes. Yeah. I haven't seen much celery in the market, actually. No, nobody has it now. Only supermarkets. It's an old name as well, Hassie. They don't see Hassie celery anymore. Now, nobody wants it. Really? Both of the days. It's just not fashionable anymore. It's not, it's not fashionable. There's so many things just not fashionable anymore because girls think that uh, young young wives now think that everything grows on trees wrapped in cellophane. <laughs> yeah. Back in Bill's salad days, the world was a much simpler place. Vegetables were grown in British soil and delivered to the market. Bill's family would then sell them onto local greengrocers whose customers were traditionally British housewives. This business had hardly changed since the market first opened in 1638. But in the last 20 years, the rise of the supermarkets has put many greengrocers out of business, and wholesalers like Bill have seen their livelihoods wither away. Lovely man, thanks again. Thanks, mate. See, I just sold a banana, it's made me a pan. I mean, that ain't enough profit. Everybody's cutting each other's throat. Emin was born and raised in the East End to Turkish Cypriot parents. What's, what's red making over there? Um, he left I'm school at 16 to join the fruit and veg trade yeah. and now runs his own store. Crap. Absolutely soft as anything. But these days, he's finding the game harder than ever. Beautiful cucumbers. I bought these two days ago, cost me 380. A box? Yeah, I made four and a half quid, which is 70p a box. You know, mushrooms and all, look, mushrooms here, it's, it's ludicrous. I make 50p to 20p a box. 11 mushrooms. It's a very hard life, ain't easy. And um, I, w I mean, I wouldn't let my son come in this business. Uh, three mushrooms, but. 480. It's all built on trust, but I'd rather serve the little man and the big boys. You know what I mean? If big boys come on here, all right, I won't entertain them. I won't. I don't want to serve them. Big boys meaning... Marco! Oh, no! For some traders, the sight of Peter approaching their stand is cause for alarm. He's a master in the art of haggling and deploys every trick in the book to get the best price. Never rush onto a firm because he thinks you get a bit excited, so you just stroll on. Uh. Try that, eh? What's this? He puts, puts potatoes in the uh, microwave, keeps your hands warm. We, we, we warm up potatoes and put them in our pocket. Used to do it with coal years ago. Let me have another look at that. What's that? Uh, how's that? How's that carpet and half of them ribbon and blues? What's the carpet? Three pounds. 
Carpet is uh, three, because years ago, if you got a three year stretch in prison, if you got three years or more in prison, you got put in prison for three years or more, you'd get a piece of carpet in your uh, cell, so it's three. Double carpet, 33. I'm talking about a carpet, I've got a carpet for a pallet and a tens. Sorry? I've got a carpet for a pallet and a tens. Have a think about it. It's not, if, listen, I'll tell you something. If it, if it had been a different mark, yeah, I'd, I'd give you a bit more money. But I'm not those, those, I've got, I've got have a similar, yeah, have four and a half quid. Right. See if you can charge me a rope for a no, pallet of Five mark, pound, five pound fifty, carpet, four and a half quid. Or a carpet for a pallet of that. Rope? Four. Backwards. I'm going to have a look at them style. Four, four spelt backwards, R O. Have a think about that. R U O F. You find me a dollar there? No, honestly, they're seriously there. Four, five pound, listen, five listen, pound listen, listen, Four and a half quid. Listen, listen. listen. I don't want you to be honest and don't be serious. To be honest with you, truthful, I'm, I'm rather no, busy. I'm rather busy. I I'll could just do with you. Fucking up. Just find me a dollar and I will. No, honestly, they're four and a half quid. That is the absolute I just want a little bit out of that four and a half quid. It just isn't there. It's five pound plus. Guess four, four Bob. No, I can't do it. Can't you do can't do it. it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Guess your book. I'll do Hello, it. Hello, pomegranates that come to. Uh, Seven pounds eighty. It's a tad too much money for me. It's just a tad. Listen, honestly, they're five pounds, four and a half quid to you if you'd like. But if you don't want, I, want them, I don't want. I want them to try to buy them. Why is it? No, if you get twenty pence, four and a half quid. Just twenty pence. Four and a half. You'll get it all back. I, You'll get it all back. So you've been selling for thirty week. years. And I've never got it back once. <laughs> they're four and a half quid. Guess two bucks for a bit of luck, yeah. You, have, you know how much luck you've got. You've got more than your fair share of luck you have already. Whatever price I give him, he will try and negotiate the best bargains. And when you're buying 20 boxes a day, it's, it's nothing. It's two quid you're argue, arguing about. But when you're buying two pallets of tomatoes, it's 30 pounds that you're arguing about. It's 10 p, it's 30 pounds different. So if you do that all, all day long, 30 pound here, 30 pound there, in a day you could go and get maybe one or 200 pounds back on your, in, in your buying. And if you do that through the course, it's a thousand pounds a week. Carpet a, pallet, carpet a pallet of Berg, and I'll give you your money for your tomatoes. 75 Berg? Yeah. And a carpet a pallet, a pallet of that black box? No, 75 Berg. 75 Berg at a carpet. carpet. Yeah. And 140 tomatoes at four and a half quid. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, that was a nice trade, wasn't it? Lovely. Didn't take long, did it? Done. That's the quickest 2,000 pounds ever been spent. <clears throat> Here's that ticket again. That's You've got television evidence how much you gave for that. I say. £4.50. What have I put down that we've got? 4 40 you slippery bastard. I can't believe I've done that for a minute. <laughs> but you know, you, you put me in a terribly bizarre situation. Is that right? I don't know I've got my trousers off. Dodgy bastard. <laughs> Let me just have a look at this. I can't believe what you said. Well, I'll be... So yeah, it says 4 40 and you saw about 20 minutes ago how it put 4.50. Then you know how he gets his money, he's a dodgy bastard. I suck. I just can't believe that for a second. Whatever made me do that, I must have had a lapse of memory of some well, sort. Habits of a lifetime are hard to break. Yes, it's no good, mate. Uh, You're right. Slippery, slippery, slippery in a can of eels. Oh, I don't know what came over me. <laughs> Two million pounds changes hands here every night. Everybody is looking for a way to keep one step ahead of the game. Brian runs a fruit store with his family in the East End of London, and margins are tight. I mean, fruit is, well, not a luxury as such, but it's, it's something people can do without, you know? Vegetables, maybe, they need, it, but things like grape and plums and nectarines and peaches, you know, it's not something they've got to have, you know? It's, it's sort of a semi-luxury, isn't it? So they do do without. Nothing you can do about it. <laughs> With express supermarkets popping up on many street corners, Brian's traditional customers have deserted him. I mean, I kind of understand why people buy fresh produce in supermarkets. They don't even know what they're paying for the stuff. Half of them haven't got a clue what they're playing for the stuff. They just pick it up, pay for it, and that's it. I mean, my wife, the other day, she bought a bunch of spring onions in Tesco, 74 pence. I went crazy. I said, we sell them five bunches for a pound. 
You're giving 74 pence for a bunch of spring onions. Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. I'm being in trouble. I am being in trouble. Yes, yeah, my vehicle. Yeah. That comes off road death. That's how I'm fat for a dog. Can't go work today, now. Nick this morning, yeah? What? Overloaded. How much? A ton. A ton. A thousand pound. A thousand pound fine for overloading his van means that Brian and his family will be working all week for nothing. Never yeah, mind. If the poor, my poor father goes skin down and keep getting fined, I can always get a driving job as a forklift driver. My old man goes to work at 12 o'clock at night, 70 years of age. He's been doing it since he was 15. Woo! He's what you call a proper grafter. You left the door open, lady. You left the door open. <laughs> huh? Brian and his son Gary have been working their stall in Upton Park, East London, for over 40 years. This is an old style, this is an old fashioned way of shopping. You've got to have a sense of humour. That's okay, darling. I know you give me one part. You are 50p in credit, and next time you come, you have 50p, no problem. No, let me have 50p. Thank you, darling. See? Upton Park International. These days, it's not just apples and pears they sell. Their customers expect more exotic fare. It's called dragon. It's very oh. sweet. It's dragon fruit. It's like my wife. It don't look very pretty, <laughs> but inside it's very sweet. Sure? Take it and try it. If you like it, you can come back. So you don't get that in Tesco's, Sainsbury's. Here, as that. Huh? You don't get custom service like that, here. Oh. You only get points. Good luck. Hold up. Anglo Saxons. I, I know it's only, uh, listen, I only served four last year. You're the first Anglo Saxons. First English people I've seen in my market this year. Hello, hello, no, please to me. Oh, this year, really? This year, yeah. I know it's only... I know, Corn and bread, I know bow. it's only the... Corn bow. and bread. Bow. 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 Jolly Carol! Auntie, Auntie, Jolly Carol! Jolly Carol! Tandy hair? What tandy hair? Egg pork, sasta, bo sasta. Shukriya. Ache hair. That's a bit of murder. Sasta mita! I think we've had time to adapt. I think we've had 50, 60 years. Listen, even before that, if you look back at 150 years ago, we had the Jewish at Whitechapel coming in, doing all the, um, all the textiles and all the materials and all that sort of thing. You've got the Bengalis at Brick Lane. We've had the Pakistanis from the late 70s. We've had um, Eastern Europeans, Kosovo's and blah, blah, blah. Well, then it doesn't matter where you go in the world, whatever country you're in, you do as the Romans do. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. And I think if they come to East London, it doesn't take long for them to... Obviously, they keep their own identity and their own culture, but also they take a bit of ours, and we take a bit of theirs, and we all live together, and it works. Johnny, Johnny, Johnny! London is a city built on immigration. For centuries, the East End has been the first port of call for many migrants. Thousand back, thousand back, thousand, 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 thousand. Spitalfields Market is a magnet for new arrivals looking for work and cheap food. The remarkable diversity of London's population is mirrored in the market, its traders, and the produce on sale. Yeah, yeah. That's a Kuano. 
from New Zealand. It's a Ramatane. Yeah, that's a, a mangosteen. Salak, snake skin. Don't really know what people do with them, to be honest with you. That's the Grenadillo. Years ago, they used to call it queer gear, but it's not really anymore. It's all everyday produce now. All this stuff, every day. When I started 15 years before, there were only a few, maybe I think maximum 15, 16 Asian people was there. So no, I think the other way around. <laughs> English, English people, the 15, 16, maybe 20. The rest of the whole market is occupied by the Asian people. Plastikas, bombaklar, yaman, mutlak. I've never had a run-in with them, but I think perhaps I'm just chicken, scared. <laughs> One of the new kings of Spitalfields is Ali Matur. Ali is a Kurdish immigrant who arrived 20 years ago, just as the market moved further east. That's from Holland, from Egypt, from Spain, from Turkey, and from Israel, South Africa. Overall, we do import from 40 different countries. Good selection. I supply all the big hotels like the Hilton, Sheraton, or whatever. We've got the customers supplying Buckingham Palace. We do our best. What a shame. I done it. Anyone can do it. This is a fantastic country. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Ali is a good man. Anyone can be good. This is really. It doesn't mean my customer's not gonna pay me, I'll kill them. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since the arrival of air freight in the 20th century, wholesalers like Ali import produce from every corner of the world. But Spitalfields was once a humble farmer's market where the produce of local growers was sold. What's that, parsley? In our new globalised world, Herman is a throwback. He still grows and supplies the market with the finest parsley, mint and courgettes money can buy. This is a lovely bit of English parsley here, um, given by Mr Herman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like, I like the Italian one. I'll tell you what's making money now, courgettes. We yeah. need them, we need them. After delivering his parsley, Herman has strict instructions from his wife to do her shopping. Every week he faces new challenges, finding her exotic ingredients. Have you got lemongrass? Yeah. yeah. Lemongrass, me. Leeks from Holland. Have you got any galanga? No galanga? Never ending in here. Go over something. West Indian, uh, Chinese, Kurds. Turks, um, ordinary Indians, Bangladeshis, and Pakistanis. They all got their little ways. <laughs> Two of these. You've got the Chinese there, so that they class themselves as superior race. You know, you, you don't tell them what to do. Uh, otherwise, they'll let you wait till next year. <laughs> I can tell my boy how many you need. But that's the way, that's their culture, isn't it? That's the way they do it. There we are. I'm a born German. I had a sh shit time as a child over there. I was only in the Hitler Youth for uh, two years. In Nazi Germany, you simply had to follow those rules. Heil Hitler, every damn move you make. Herman ran away from the Hitler Youth and found his way to England, where he volunteered for the British Army. After the war, he built his farm in Essex and helped Britain to overcome her food shortage. He supplied Spitalfields for over 50 years 
but recently found it hard running the farm on his own. Then Herman met Patty, a migrant farmer from the paddy fields of Thailand who was hunting for work. You used to work on a rice yeah. farm? Yeah. yeah, in Thailand. Uh -huh. we, we come from farm, right? Farm life anyway. Yeah, really hard work. Brought up like that, mm. right from the word go, we had to work. Mm. My mum, my dad got 13 children. 13? Yeah. Wow. I am number 12. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're doing a good job, girl. Thank you, honey. <laughs> I'm nearly 80, so there isn't a lot of energy left there. If you want to survive, you've got to hold out your hand in friendship and have a caring attitude towards everybody. Because you depend on them and they depend on you. Herman married Patty five years ago. And after this parsley season, they plan to leave England and grow bananas in Thailand. The market is a man's world. But there are a few young women who are braving spittlefields every night to serve tea. Lucy is the market's newest arrival. She left her home in Romania to find work in London. Excuse me, hello? Come on, baby, come on. Come, come. Come on, you ready to pussy? How are you, how are you? get abused here. I mean, all, all of them get abused, especially on the uh, um, Kurdish firm, they, they get mobbed. Yeah. yeah, especially by him. Yeah. He don't leave him alone. But, um, I can't, I don't. I've got my self-respect. I love my wife, I love my children. I, you know, I don't, I don't hanky-panky, nothing like that, you know. It's not for me. I'm too old anyway. I learned how in what glass, how many sugar, if it's strong or light or normal thing. Excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, this is your seat. Thank you very much, darling, yeah? Welcome, drink uh, one day with two sugar. I stay here 12 hours, no? Because I need money. In the home, eat, do shower, and sleep. And my life is in market. Yes, my life is in market. And uh, I miss my mother very much. Spitalfields opens its giant doors to anyone willing to put in the hours. But working every hour through the long nights is a challenge to even the most determined. It sometimes can be very, very hard. It's part of the game. I enjoy it. But I don't want my kids to come into the industry. No, no. It doesn't matter how much money you are earning here, you wouldn't, you, you're not going to enjoy it. That's why you've got to keep eye on it all the time stressful so it is not an easy easy lifestyle but i didn't come from the easy life anyway i come from the rough life two of my cousins uh, been killed by turkish army my sister has been in prison for 11 months there was torching on her and uh, it doesn't matter what's the, in the, in the, even in the worst, worst, worst scenario, you've got to just try to fix as much as you can, try to change as much as you can. So, but now we are selling tomato here. Huh? When I first came here about 16 years ago, I had a 
a very small stand and I used to have four or five pallets of lemons to sell. I think last year about, uh, we done about between 18 to 20 million we done last year. Many of the new traders in the market have a story to tell and countries they cannot return to because of their religious beliefs. From the 19th century, tens of thousands of Jews have fled persecution in Eastern Europe and arrived at London's docks. Many found a home in the East End and became regular customers in Spitalfields. They're 1080. To you. 9.60 to you. Yeah. 8.50. 8.50 for fives. 14. <laughs> you just, what's the matter with you? You're getting hard of hearing, you are. Hey? Yeah. Mr. Cole? Okay. <laughs> He's a lovely man, isn't he? All the best to you. Bless me. How yeah. many years we know oh, each other? Too many years. I knew you when you didn't shave. <laughs> He's a, he's a good old man. I've known him donkey's years. Donkey's old from the old market. Yeah. What's his story? Um, Mr. Khan, he, he doesn't he doesn't talk about it very much, but I know that he was a Holocaust survivor. He was obviously a very young man then. Joseph also survived the Second World War. Give me this. You want them ones? I want them ones, yes. He's been buying from Spitalfields for more than 40 years now. No, oversold leaks today. Pomegranates, three pounds. He runs a small grocery shop in North London where he serves the local Hasidic community. Every day, Joseph consults the Torah to help guide him in life and business. We've lived, according to this book, for thousands of years. We lost lives for the sake of this book. I hope I will get some. Yes. Joseph must obey a set of strict dietary laws when buying and selling fruit and vegetables. We are not allowed to eat certain creatures, insects, or flies, or worms, snakes. It's part of it, you can't, not allowed. It's against the law. So there are certain produces which are infested, like greens, certain lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, pineapples, same thing. Sometimes you have to check plums, cut it in half and check it with the inside, around the pip. There's no any creatures. You have to check. Thank God has given you the light and give you eyes to see. Two lemons. Two lemons and seven uh, tomatoes. Let me just double check them, just like you went back. We checked them yesterday. Check, you check. I will fucking sure. check it. I don't trust Italians. The market is a broad church with many creeds and cultures tightly packed beneath its roof. But there's not much that's sacred yes, here. 
Uh, the best religion in the world is us. Not Roman Catholic. You're all puffs, all your priests are Do whatever you want. They're young boys, aren't they? Do whatever you want. How many young priests are straight? Yeah. They're doing young boys, they give well, them the fortune. I don't like Turks. I don't be any friend with Turks. I don't know. The, something I don't like of them. Oh, he loves me, really. He loves me. He loves me. No. We've been good friends for 30 years. I've been to his house. I've used his toilet. In, in the, the shed. <laughs> in the shed. <laughs> in the shed. In the shed. Never in the home. Because they're dirty. He's a loyal customer. Don't get me wrong. He comes here every day. He'll buy something. But if I'm too dear, he'll go somewhere else. Even for 20 pence, he'll go for somewhere else. Nobody's using. Yeah. I'm sure they're Jews, not the Roman Catholics. Put that on TV. Tell him to be kicked up. All these people are interested is your money. Like thousands of Sikhs living in Britain, Karpul's family escaped from India during the violent partition of Pakistan in 1947. He was born in the East End, and from an early age, Karpul's father encouraged him to be a model citizen. His first job as a paperboy to the Cray brothers wasn't quite what his father had in mind. The Crays were at uh, those days in the blind beggar they were. And we used to deliver to the blind beggar where the craze used to actually, actually go in that pub. We used to give the papers to them. And then we asked for the money for them because we knew who they were. Got me one box of Obu Jin. These days, Karpul helps out at his local temple by securing the best deals here with donations. Up to a thousand homeless people will be arriving at his temple tonight, hoping to be fed. These days, too many people are starving there. How much is that? How much springs? Huh? Ooh, bit high, isn't it? How much are bananas, mate? They're planting. <laughs> Honestly. Huh? Have you got bananas? No. no? OK. You know, I just want to check on this how much he's got cauliflower for. Hey? Buying for the temple. How oh, is he? Yeah. They've got red cauliflower. They've got red cauliflower. They just have to put the rain in their pocket. Pay for it. End off. At the end of the day, this food, what we're buying today, we buy all the time. It's not just today. We buy it, we give it to the temple. Because what it is, you find people, there's no work, and they're hungry, and they're homeless. They let them come to the temple. They can eat, and that's it. There's no jobs about. People are going to starve. You know what I mean? Homeless people. They're the people you've got to look feed. Um, I think we got the next one up, yeah? Well, this one, cauliflower. A banana. Last one's 1750. And the two's here, seven quid, yeah? These one? Seven, seven yeah, quid. Seven quid. Just pack a banana, like, you know what I mean? You ain't gonna get any cheaper than that in nowhere. Everybody knows that Cockney accent from fucking miles away, there. <laughs> fucking hell, he's the only one who speaks Cockney, I think. How much a banana, mate? We're Muslims here, my friend. We don't care about a temple. <laughs> Sorry, that's eight pound now, that's a <laughs> yeah. Four critics charged me for it. That's a good deal, that is. That'll be better tomorrow. Carper has gone from being a Cockney rebel to a devout Sikh. When his father died 17 years ago, he put on the turban for the first time and vowed to make his father proud. My father always said, son, you always got to look, look after other people. You know? Don't worry about yourself. Look after everybody. So give them a bit of food. They do well with the goods. God will thank me one day. I'm looking for something called an etrog. I think it's sort of something like a lemon and a lime, very large with very pointed bits, for a special Jewish ceremony where fruits become symbolic of states of the soul. Are you, are you a religious person? Not at all. I'm only invited if I can find these certain very rare fruits. It's the beginning of February, and the market draws in people like Sue, who are shopping for Tubish fat, the Jewish New Year of the trees. Excuse me. Good morning. Do you know something called an etrog? 
An etrog, a fruit. Etrog? Yeah. I never heard this thing before, actually. Mm -hmm. I never heard this before. The, best, the best place, maybe Chinese people, maybe they said. Yeah. In the middle of it. Mr. Ming, I'm looking for something called an etrog. Would you be able to help me? Etrog. Etrog. Not etrog. Ati chow. No, it's sort of a, a bit like a lemon. Large. Go to it, try JT. JT. Okay. Go and try the JT. Thank you. You see, it's not the time of year for etrogs. It's got two points at either side. Or maybe at least one point. It's a fruit. It's a fruit, yeah. Hard skin or something? Hard, like a lemon, but bigger. And it smells a bit like a lime, I think. Sure, and a pomelo. Mm -hmm. What we call a pomelo. I don't know what a pomelo is. Pomelo. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, the, no, it's not. No, I know what it looks like because I've seen them. I'm looking for a mysterious fruit called an etrog. It's a citrus fruit. Etrog. Etrog. It's, it's like a lemon and a lime. It's big. It's, it's not a Bangladeshi fruit, is it? No. Are you Bangladeshi? No, I'm yeah. not. I'm a Turk. No, no, oh, really? Bangladesh. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Well, you have offended. Well, I didn't. I don't know. I don't mean to. <laughs> Turkey is meant to be a fantastic place. I listened to a radio program of a Turkish writer last night. Brilliant. I wonder why he didn't like Bangladeshis, where he was an insulter. Yeah. Are people are so racist. It's natural, I suppose, unfortunately. I, maybe we could get away with a large lemon. Could that pass as an etrog? Is it just a big lemon with a point? Mm. I th that's it. That's what the thing. It's meant to be a fragrance, which is probably what they would call a spiritual fragrance, which puts one in mind of paradise. Back at the temple, Karpu's bananas are about to undergo their own spiritual transformation. They will get blessed. When you do the pray. He's doing a prayer now. Once the prayer is done, then they get blessed. He's going to take the holy book out there. Some people might think it's strange what we're doing, but at the end of the day, each box of food, yeah, it's got a life in there. So these are blessed bananas now. Yeah. This is blessed, oh, yeah. it's all blessed. It's a lot of food, isn't it? Well, it, it is. Well, now you expect a lot of people will be coming in a temple. It's, got, it's always been pure veg, pure veg. Anything, no egg or no meat or anything like that, it's always done pure veg. And so, how many people do you feed a week? It's uncountable because ten, ten there's, there's a huge, more, more, lovely, more, probably more than. Yeah. You see coaches coming from other counties. This is the biggest temple yes. in whole England. Most people do not have a spiritual connection with food. You know what I mean? <laughs> You're very lucky because I have. Ah. I have, yes. This is the end of a long quest, you know. Is it really? I've been looking for, yeah. for it all evening. Do you know why the Jews value it so much? Well, they believe yes. that it represents the, the human heart. Ah, the human heart, that's Some very interesting. They believe it represents the human yeah. heart. But others believe that it is actually the forbidden fruits oh, in the Garden of Eden and not the apple. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. I thought it was because it smells of paradise. Bring out the Edrog. Yay, the Edrog. You're Edrog. <laughs> Thank you. People are gathering to celebrate Tubushvat. Exotic fruits are central to the ceremony. The etrog is meant to contain the scent of the Garden of Eden. Smell. Do not taste the etrog. Do not eat it. Thanks. Mmm. Smell it. 
Right up here on camera. Wonderful. Life. It's the pure spell. I'm no good on fruit. I don't come here. That's actually really. But here you are at a festival of fruit. Hmm? Here you are at a festival of fruit. I know, but I'm here because it's friends. It's my friends. Listen, I'm a widow. We don't get off our start often, so I can't afford to turn any invitation down, is the truth. Oh God, please quench with rain the dry wilderness. Bless the grapes, the figs, and the pomegranates. Oh God, please raise up the imprisoned children and bless the walnuts, dates, and apricots. Oh God, please deliver the congregation that longs to be near you and bless the berries, the pears, the walnuts and the citrons. Voila. A nice blood orange, look. What people don't know, that's a blood orange. People don't know them. While for some, the complex flavours of the market are a cause for celebration. For others, they're a threat. It's all our Afghan friends. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six. All our Afghan friends, look. Seven. Surrounding, look. Like a pack of wolves. London 2012. Like a pack of wolves, like a pack of dogs. On heat. It'd be in a dictionary soon, greengrocer. Used to sell fruit and me. <laughs> Finished. Dying industry, like the prints, like the docks. Like greengrocers, a dying industry. I'm 69 this month. I could have retired years ago. But then I'll carry on with my son here because there's no one really to carry on with him. It's tough. It's real, real tough. Tough, mate. The hours, the hours, I mean, you're doing six days a week up here now. They should try and get it down to five, and it'll probably be a better business. Shut one more, shut on a Monday, say, shut on a Monday, and get it to a five-day week. The foreign foreigners don't want it to happen. Let's be honest about it. English people go to supermarkets. They don't get what they pay. But the ethnics, they go to the markets. They have some stalls and shops. So the more ethnics, better for us, really, in the long run. I mean, um, all they talk about the immigration, all that. I, I let, them, let them come in. He's got, he's got his, look, five bullet holes he's got in him, look. One, two, three, they've run out with a machine gun. <laughs> Where was that? Uh, that Orphanstone. Orphanstone? <laughs> <laughs> oh. why, why did that happen? That's my country is too much trouble. It's from Afghanistan. Look, three Afghans, look. One, two, three. Imbeciles. I'll tell, I'll tell you what to say, right? I'm all taped up. You don't tell me what to do. I'll tell you, right? You're in our country, you abide by our rules. I'm all taped up. Yeah, I'll see, that's what they're like. That's it. What are they saying? What's that? Who's that? It's Islamic, Islamic Masjid. Yeah, Masjid. It's saying like, our country is best, our country is. Really? Yeah. It's all babble, 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 and just foreign languages I hear. It doesn't seem natural. I mean, even for goodness sake, you know. For all intents and purposes, I could be in a different country. Occasionally, cultural tensions in the market come to the surface. Scuffle, scuffle, over the yam. Every Saturday morning, many Nigerians come to Spitalfields looking for fresh yams. It's customary to cut open the vegetable to check its quality before buying. This can sometimes lead to arguments. This is a bullring, mate. <laughs> a human bullring. <laughs> they want to pick pieces out of bottles. Don't say what you don't know. You wasn't there. You wasn't standing anywhere here. I know your custom. I know what you want. 
Who you trying to say? You know our custom. You don't say nothing. You don't know. What custom are we? You don't have to say nothing. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you. Yeah, you explain it to you. Calm, calm down. But don't do that. Don't do that. You just came here. and So many bad people in the world. They're killing each other from every each country, even here. What for? We are professional traders. We are here for money. We just look at our figures. How much money are we making? Are we making any money or not? Then you don't think about the nationalities, about the ethnics, about the language, about the culture. At the end of the day, when I see my reports, I said, I said, hmm, it's good. To make it here takes more than just market knowledge and a head for business. Peter's need to be number one borders on the obsessive. Man's given me a job to do, and now it's a test whether I can do it. He's the executive chef at Rothschild's Bank, and uh, he wants some long, long beans. I hope I, can, I hope I can find them. I've got a rough idea where I can find them, but it might take a little bit of ducking and diving. Ever since Peter was kicked out of school, he has been driven to succeed at all costs. The thought of not being successful frightens me. So there's a fear. There's a fear factor there. The fear of being a failure. I could not handle that. That would, that would kill me. And so that's why I do what I do. They're called yard beans. Long beans, long green beans. Long beans? Not that well. They're lovely. They are lovely. I, yeah. I, want, I might need something a little bit longer. Well, we'll stretch them. Yeah, yeah. stretch them, yeah. yeah. I've got something else for you to stretch <laughs> later on. <laughs> uh. <laughs> long bean. Long bean, long kenya bean. I have beans here, Bobby beans. What, no, not Bob. Not no, let me have a look. Yeah. No, nah, no, they need a long one. They're a bit big, actually. They're a little bit big. Where is he in there? You don't know. There's a don't know here, dear. How are you going? I want a box of long beans. You got a Thailand one? Let me have a little Thailand one, please. That's better. That's better. How much for a charm? 22 pounds. You want 20 pounds for two boxes? Cash? 21 cost. Really? Yeah. Alright, give me two boxes. Thank you very much, alright? You spent 25,000 pounds a night here. About it. And you haggle over a quid? Yeah. Some people, some people think that's a bit mad. It all adds up, doesn't it? It all adds up. I can't help myself. It's like a second nature. Hello, Tommy. Well, it's all fell into place. I'll, I'll, we're not the match. When, when bang, 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 whatever I said, he took me money. At one stage, I thought I were going to get them beans. Keep trying, never give up when you find them. As the market winds down, Peter is one of the last to leave. But this commitment has come at a price. This is my world. This is my life. And that's a terribly sad thing to say. My wife would be over the moon me saying that. My business to me has been like uh, another woman, I'm afraid. And I've probably took more care of this other woman than, than what I have of my wife. Um, so I did throw. Uh, body and soul into the business where perhaps I should have thrown a little bit into the marriage.
Bill will have plenty of time to put into his marriage. Today is his last morning as the owner of his stand. He's been unable to adapt to Londoners' changing tastes, so after a lifetime of supplying celery, he sold his historic family business to newcomers, Polish mushroom importers. What about, what about her? I'm not sure what we're doing with her. I'll dismantle her, take her off the wall and decide what I'm going to do with her. Yeah. <laughs> Relics from the past. same office for many years. His office is like a part of his body, his arm, his legs, his brain, his heart. You're gonna bury him in the same office hopefully when he's die anyway. <laughs> I, I knew you can't do without this. This is trouble of the old-fashioned people in the market. They will go to just reorganize themselves, but they don't. Market is losing power. They used to be king, not the customer. Now, customers are the kings. Twenty-one years it was there. Twenty-one years. Some people have said it's an end of an era. It's for everyone. I'm just going to be a lost soul, I suppose. It is tough, very tough. You would just accept this industry as a lifestyle. Uh, you're part of it. Then you make money. Can local food markets break our love affair with the superstore? Listen to the experts and share your views. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash London markets and follow links to the Open University. Michael Wood's Great British Story continues this week here on BBC HD. Don't miss the next chapter tomorrow night at nine. Next this evening, we're off to Yellowstone National Park in the depths of winter. <laughs>